Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 17, July 12th through July 18th, 1861. Last week, we had stops in Missouri and West Virginia before talking a little bit about Harriet Jacobs. This week, we will wrap up our early action in West Virginia and then head back to Northern Virginia to set all the pieces on the board for First Manassas. Finally, we will take a little bit of time to talk about slave rebellions in the South leading up until this point. Let's first see what George B. McClellan's Ohio Department is up to first. As we ended last week, Rich Mountain had cut a force of Confederates into two and forced General Robert Garnett to withdraw from his position at Laurel Hill. In the wake of the disaster, Garnett would withdraw his men originally toward the town of Beverly, but was told incorrectly that the Federal forces were actually occupying that town. McClellan did want to press his advantage and order General Thomas Morris to pursue the remnants of Garnett's men as they fell back toward Virginia proper. Thomas Morris had attended West Point, but was a railroad man before the war. He commanded a brigade of Indiana regiments. Instead of continuing his career in the Army, he would resign and go back into the railroad business in 1862. Morris would become the president of the Indianapolis and St. Louis Railroad. The Indiana Brigade would pursue Garnett to a fork in the Cheat River at a place called Corix Ford, about 30 miles from Rich Mountain on July 13, 1861. All along the way, the Confederates would discard supplies to aid in their flight. Now, in this particular fork, the river is necessary to be forded twice before continuing toward Virginia. Garnett would lead men downriver to make a stand and delay the oncoming Federals. Sharpshooters of the 23rd Virginia would exchange fire from across the river. As Garnett continued to give orders to his troops, preparing to withdraw again, a shot from the Union troops killed him instantly. Garnett would become the first general officer killed in the war. Confederate troops evaporated, leaving supplies and a cannon, as well as the body of their commanding officer. Twenty would be killed or wounded, but many more would be lost in the retreat, either to desertion or capture. Garnett's body would be recovered by the men under Thomas Morris and sent back to his family for burial. So to recap, There have been three skirmishes now in West Virginia, and none have gone well for the Confederacy. All have gone well for the Wheeling Convention and George B. McClellan, who will soon play a more major part of the war effort in Virginia proper. Speaking of Virginia proper, let's head back to the situation just outside of Washington, D.C., When last we mentioned events, we talked about the Battle of Hoax Run and the failure of General Robert Patterson to occupy Joseph E. Johnson's army, which would allow those reinforcements to meet with P.G.T. Beauregard and his confusingly named Army of the Potomac. Irving McDowell had massed a large body of men in the nation's capital and pressure mounted to do something with this force. McDowell knew that the men under his command were extremely green and probably not ready to move forward, but unfortunately he would have to do so anyway. The Confederates had taken up positions all along Bull Run Creek south of Centerville, Virginia. As McDowell's 35,000 men advanced, they had retired to this position and dug in at various positions. Union 1st Division, under Daniel Tyler, was tasked with reconnaissance. 
His orders were to observe well the roads to Bull Run and Warrington. Do not bring on an engagement, but keep up the impression that we are moving on Manassas. Manassas Junction was an important railroad hub nearby where the Confederates had concentrated their forces. Tyler was an older general, being born in 1799, the son of a Bunker Hill veteran. The Connecticut-born Tyler had resigned from the Army in 1834 and had a successful career in railroads and canals. Apparently, he was pretty good at taking over bankrupt ventures and turning them around to make a profit. In 1861, General Tyler now stared at Bull Run near Blackburn's and Mitchell's Ford. He wished to determine the strength of the enemy he knew to be waiting there. A brigade under Israel Richardson would move forward, supported by artillery, under Roman Ayers. Ayers has a battery of 12-pound field howitzers, so we should have a good idea of what those are now. He had attended West Point and saw no action during the Mexican-American War. Immediately prior to the war, Ayers was serving as an artillery instructor at Fort Monroe. He would rise to the command a division in the Army of the Potomac. I will take a pause to introduce Israel Richardson, or Fighting Dick as he was called. Richardson was a native of Vermont and a descendant of Revolutionary War General Israel Putnam, who commanded troops at Bunker Hill. Richardson would attend West Point and serve in the Seminole and Mexican-American Wars before resigning his commission. Before the war started, he would be living as a farmer in Pontiac, Michigan. During the war, he would obtain a reputation as an organizer and a disciplinarian, eventually rising to division command. His brigade on July 18, 1861 would consist of the 1st Massachusetts, 12th New York, and 2nd and 3rd Michigan. Hidden along the wooded banks of Bull Run would be Virginia and North Carolina men under one James Longstreet. If Thomas Jackson would become the right arm of Robert E. Lee, Longstreet would most likely become the left. He was born in South Carolina in 1821. Longstreet had a tough time at West Point, almost failing several subjects, but managed to still pull through. During Longstreet's time at West Point, despite uh, obviously having some problems, he was taught by Mahan, who we discussed during our tactics segment. James would be wounded in the Mexican-American War. Afterwards, he would continue in the Army, serving at various frontier posts until the outbreak of hostilities. Fun fact as well, it is uh, widely believed that Longstreet was present for the wedding of Ulysses S. Grant and Julia Dent, and in some cases, he may have been the best man uh, at the wedding, but uh, I have also seen how that might not necessarily have been true, although uh, it's, it's, it's very well regarded that he, he was present, at least. Longstreet will have a mark on engagements, mostly in the Eastern Theater, moving forward. After the war, he does well to become a member of the Republican Party, commanding black militia against white supremacists in New Orleans in 1874. He will also serve as an ambassador to the Ottoman Empire and U.S. Marshal. And actually, just to sort of mention Longstreet's acceptance into the Republican Party, uh, he obviously he was a good friend of Ulysses S. Grant, so that's sort of where that comes from. Um, but there is this narrative after the war uh, that is very negative on James Longstreet, so uh, there's a lot of um, contemporary sources out there uh, for folks. Uh, Jubal Early is one of them. I know we have uh, maybe sort of mentioned him, but uh, he does not like Longstreet, obviously, after the war. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sort of heaping the blame onto Longstreet for battles like, say, Gettysburg. Uh, he's very heavily criticized uh, there. And uh, obviously, some of the blame maybe could be could be leveled at Longstreet, but uh, it is almost uh, overwhelmingly slow in some cases and probably probably not fair. So... Uh, that's something that we can keep in mind moving forward. 
In July of 1861, Longstreet has under his command several Virginia regiments and one from North Carolina. He also has a contingent of the famous Washington Artillery from New Orleans. Union guns would open fire and receive no response at first. The 1st Massachusetts would advance and engage skirmishers from the Confederate ranks. The guns of Ayers would be rolled forward with more of Richardson's infantry in support. Soon, guns on both sides would erupt, the Confederates pouring fire from their positions. The 12th New York would break and run, which for a moment exposed the 1st Massachusetts. They were able to withdraw in good order. Union artillery would fire some 415 shots compared to the Confederate 310. Tyler would be satisfied that the army was in force and in strong positions and eventually order his men to withdraw. There would be 83 Union casualties as compared to 68 from the Confederates. Tyler would be reprimanded for exceeding his orders, and although the 12th New York did withdraw in a disorderly fashion, two of their members would receive the Medal of Honor for refusing to leave the field. This engagement is also important because McDowell was able to gather that he would have to move further upstream to flank the Confederate force. He would attempt to do so only three days later, which sets us up nicely for our first major battle of the war, which we will get into in full detail next week. So to close out today, I want to go over some more well-known slave revolts in North America, and we will go in chronological order. Now, there were some revolts that occurred in the Caribbean, but only a few that occurred in American proper. For instance, there was a war in Jamaica between the British government forces and Maroons, or escaped slaves, who dwelt in the mountains. Of course, we have the most successful slave rebellion in Haiti uh, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. The largest of the colonial period in America was known as the Chesapeake Rebellion in Princess Anne County, Virginia, which ended with several hundreds of slaves fleeing into the Great Dismal Swamp, which, as it is sort of described, is a large swamp in southeast Virginia, but they were apprehended by authorities and native allies as well. So very early on in the in terms of the colony of Virginia, right? It is interesting to note that a treaty with the Cherokee actually included a fugitive slave clause, much like what we talked about in the first couple of episodes. We will start with Gabriel's Rebellion of 1800. Gabriel Prosser was born into slavery in Henrico County. He was taught to read and write and was a skilled blacksmith. Now we talked about how a plantation owner might hire out his slaves as means for making money, and those in the skilled category could be sent to work with neighbors or in nearby Richmond. It is most likely that Gabriel would learn about the struggles of the Haitian slaves, as well as the French Revolution on such trips. It should be noted that there was also a struggle of working-class Democratic Republicans against Federalists at this time, so there could be some inspiration there as well. Poor whites, Gabriel surmised, would join the slaves. An altercation with a white man, which Gabriel was spared execution, but Brandon instead, was the tipping point. After recruiting from the surrounding area, Gabriel planned to lead slaves into Richmond, but had to postpone due to bad weather. This was unfortunate because two slaves reported the planned uprising. Governor and future president James Monroe called out the militia, and the rebellion was no more. It is theorized that perhaps James Monroe was the target of the rebellion and would have been forced to exchange his release from captivity for freedom for the slaves. Gabriel Prosser swam to a ship and attempted to flee, but was turned in by another slave for the reward, of which they were only given 50 out of a potential 300. Of course, because, you know, obviously they were a slave, uh, so that was sort of the reasoning behind that they weren't you know, given the full reward. He was out on trial, but refused to speak. Gabriel, as well as his two brothers, 
and 23 other of his conspirators were executed as a result. In 1822, we have another attempted slave revolt, this time in South Carolina, which was led by Denmark Vesey. Denmark Vesey's early life is unclear, although it is likely that perhaps he was born in St. Thomas and took the name Denmark after the country who ruled St. Thomas at the time. Vesey was able to actually purchase his freedom after winning the lottery in 1799 and started an African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. As a member of the church, he was able to travel and teach religious classes, which would be key to spreading the word of rebellion. Inspired by the events in Haiti, Denmark planned for an insurrection that would include the murder of the white enslavers, the liberation of Charleston, and the escape to Haiti. He would also be inspired by the congressional debates surrounding Missouri, which we talked about in the first few episodes. South Carolina having a large slave population, it's possible this revolt would have included thousands. Much in the same manner as Gabriel, slaves would inform authorities who move quickly and arrest 131 men, 67 of which, including Denmark Vesey, would be executed. Now, Nat Turner's rebellion is probably the most well-known slave rebellion in America, occurring in 1831 in Virginia. Nat Turner was born in Southampton County, Virginia, in 1800. He learned to read and write and was reportedly very intelligent. Much like Denmark Vesey, he would use the Bible to support anti-slavery. Unlike Vesey, Nat Turner reported to have received visions from God and that he was destined for a greater purpose. To quote one such vision, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent, for the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first, and by signs in the heavens that it would make known to me when I should commence the great work, and until first sign appeared, I should conceal it from the knowledge of men, and on the appearance of the sign, I should arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies with their own weapons. An eclipse of the sun would occur in February of 1831, which was interpreted as this signal. Turner would lead fellow slaves on a rampage that would see 55 white people killed, including the family of Nat Turner's owner. State militia and federal troops would rally and disperse the 40 or so followers of Turner. Nat would escape, but was eventually discovered and captured. He was tried and executed on November 11th, among 55 others. Unfortunately, the hysteria involved in the revolt would see many other blacks killed by mobs. I want to mention two successful events involving slave ships, Amistad and the Creole. The Amistad occurred in 1839, and the Creole occurred in 1841. Both were slave ships illegally transporting kidnapped peoples to the New World. In both cases, the enslaved individuals were able to take control of the ship. The Creole turned into British Jamaica, where the British, who had outlawed slavery, ruled in their favor and granted 17 their freedom. In the case of the Amistad, it might surprise you to know that there was actually a court ruling in the United States that supported freedom for the enslaved. Once they lost control of the ship, the captured Spanish were told to sail back to Africa, but instead ended up in Long Island, New York. The U.S. Federal District Court ruled that the individuals had a right by force, if necessary, to fight their captors and that the kidnapping was illegal. Eventually, they were returned to Sierra Leone. The Supreme Court confirmed the ruling of the district court. This, unfortunately, would be overshadowed by the later Dred Scott case we talked about in Episode 3. 
I think we can go ahead and stop right there for the week. This one was a little bit shorter, but I think we still managed to cover quite a bit. We had Corks Ford and Blackbirds Ford in West Virginia and Virginia. We talked about the rebellions of Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner. We also had the lesser-known events surrounding the Amistad and the Creole. Next week, we will spend the time talking about First Bull Run, so get excited. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the Patreon, Venmo information, as well as a link to the website. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Feedback is welcome. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, all are welcome. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great week.